Welcome back to the Gift Beats Vegas podcast. It is time for the divisional round. Wildcard round was a bit crazy, I'll admit that. Most of the games went how I thought they would, or at least the outcomes felt realistic to me. Two of them didn't. So I'll go through those quick, give a quick recap, and then we'll get to the picks for the divisional round. And also, don't forget, guys, when the season's over, this becomes a NFL news channel. We talk about coaches being hired and fired. We talk about free agency. We talk about the draft. We're also going to throw out some NBA picks during the offseason, too. So the podcast definitely isn't going anywhere, and I'm excited about that. But let's talk about that wild card round because I know a lot of you guys were pissed. I was definitely pissed. And it kind of felt just like last year. I was like, what is this? Like, just didn't feel like an exciting, realistic wild card round weekend. So the first game started off very realistic. The Seahawks have been playing above their head all season. And they went up against a juggernaut in the 49ers that possibly could contend for a Super Bowl. They have a Super Bowl caliber defense. So the end result was realistic. 41 49ers, 23 Seahawks. When you look at that Seahawks defense, I mean, really on, on both sides of the ball, but really the defense on paper, I mean, they look like the worst defense in football. Next, right next to the Chicago Bears, a little bit better than them. So for the 49ers to dismantle them like that in the second half made sense. Really, they should have dismantled them in the first half because you got all these interchangeable parts like McCaffrey, Debo Samuel. Kittle at tight end, even the second, third string receivers step up, make plays. And the Seahawks really don't have anybody to stop the number ones, let alone the depth on this team. So to me, that was realistic. The Seahawks really aren't even a playoff team. And that result made sense. The next game really was not realistic to me. And I said that the Chargers either lost this game because they have terrible coaching or because as you guys know, Vegas, the politics in the NFL, they wanted the Jaguars to come back. Lombardi is one of the worst offensive coordinators I've ever seen. Him and his brother. Um, as far as I'm concerned, I respect the hell out of Vince Lombardi. He definitely was an icon in this game. But his offspring don't know shit about football. And they really need to stop doing favors for friends at the NFL level. You should deserve, You should earn the right to get in the NFL, not just because of your name. So that let me say that. So realistically, I understand that that was part of it. But the other part, the part that's unrealistic to me and how the Jaguars came back from 27-0 is how many comebacks can we see in one year where the vastly superior team rises up late and comes back? I mean, that happens once in a while. And when you go look back at NFL history, that's not something that happened often. And then when you look at other sports too, and I used an analogy in a comment that I left one of my subscribers, I said, look, how many times did you see a fight with two really good boxers or two really good UFC fighters where the match goes for eight rounds or whatever, and one fighter is just dominant, beating the shit out of the other one. The other one runs out of gas. They can't do nothing. But then magically, all of a sudden, that guy comes back and wins doesn't happen it's unrealistic and we've already seen the biggest comeback in nfl history with the vikings in the regular season against the colts possibly because of a live bet so you're you're telling me that we're going to see these great all these great comebacks in one year what's going to happen next year are we going to see all these great comebacks again I, i'm really curious to see because this shit don't happen regularly in regular sports it just doesn't i mean a comeback here there it happens miracles happen great you know, that's why Rocky is a movie. I mean, because, you know, I mean, look at the fight with him and Apollo Creed. Same analogy. He gets his face punched in, what, a thousand times? No fighter could take that. Just like no fighter like the Jags could come down from 27-0. At least not at the rate that's happening in the NFL level this season. So I wanted to make that a point, guys. So, yeah, Chargers lost. We were wrong. They were dominant for the first, what, two and a half quarters, whatever. Didn't work out all right, we lose. I'm fine with that. I don't, I personally don't put a ton of money on the NFL anymore because you, you guys see what's going on. I mean, you'd be crazy. You'd be crazy to do it. I'm sure that you guys get lucky once in a while and you, you hit a winning ticket, you know, you get three, four, right. But there's no way that there's any consistency to this. 
there's absolutely no way you might win one week. I hear from one guy one week. He's like, yeah, I hit. Then I don't hear from him again for six weeks in the comment section. So I already know what's up. So that game to me was just complete bullshit. Dolphins bills was the other game that felt like bullshit to me. The rest all felt realistic. This one though, those two did not. And the bills, I mean, you guys saw it. I mean, they were up 14, nothing. Allen was moving the football. They made it look easy. Then all of a sudden, Allen reverts back into his, hey, they just gave me $400 million, so I'm going to do what the league tells me mode. Then he starts playing like he's never played the game before. Last time I checked, when we ended last season, the year before this one, he was throwing touchdowns at will against the Kansas City Chiefs in the championship game. And I'm supposed to believe that now he doesn't even play as good as a second or third string quarterback? Come on. There's only so much that I'm willing to believe. And then I'm supposed to believe that Skylar Thompson, who's a third-string quarterback, with three offensive linemen out, is going to come into this game and dominate a Bills defense that was number one last season and everybody but Micah Hyde's out there for the Buffalo Bills this year. So I guess the whole theory of finding the quarterback is just out the window. So the Dolphins should go with Skylar Thompson next year, right, since he can contend with one of the best teams uh, in the NFL at a playoff level, right? Makes no fucking sense to me, guys, but there you go. Bills ended up winning. I mean, the NFL got what they want because they get that Bill Cincy game, but obviously the spread was blown. Bills proved early on in that game that they could blow the Dolphins out. Somebody said put a lid on that, let the Dolphins have a chance. That's my opinion on it. Hey, want to stop following me? Stop following the podcast, whatever, but that makes no logical football sense. Next game made complete sense. Giants beat the Vikings. Yeah, I took the Vikings. I was wrong about that. That's fine. Um, I was wrong. This was a three-point spread. The Vikings defense has struggled all year. Kirk Cousins has struggled all year. No surprise that the Giants pulled off this upset. Happy for him, actually. Another New York team, Brian Dable, former ex-Buffalo Bill, my favorite team. That was all realistic to me. No problems there. Um, Giants are well-coached, good play calling. They do have a good offensive line. They run the football well, and their defense has improved from last season. They do have a good pass rush now. They're physical up front, and they got a Dory Jackson back and Xavier McKinney, so their secondary isn't trash anymore. They're back and ready to go. So no surprise that they beat the inferior Vikings. Next game, Ravens versus Bengals. I felt like this one was realistic. Um, the only thing that kind of made me feel a little bit weird – because I, I felt it coming, was when the Ravens had a chance to take the lead when they were going to go up 24 uh, and they were going to have that touchdown lead and Hunley fumbled at the goal line. I, I felt like that was a little bit fishy because I just kind of felt like something was going to come where it wasn't going to let them win because obviously they want Bills Bengals in the next round. I hate to I mean, I hate to point that out, but other than that play, other than that play by Hundley, I felt like this game was realistic because the Ravens have a really good defense, a very good defense, especially with Marcus Peters back in the lineup with Humphrey. So the fact that they were able to regulate the Bengals' offense made sense to me. And the fact that the Ravens were able to lean heavy on their on their really good offensive line and run game, now that Dobbins is healthy, was really realistic too, and the read option with Huntley. So the fact that this was the close game did not surprise me. I felt like football-wise it made sense but that one play was a little weird. And we'll cap it off with the Cowboys beating the Buccaneers. This was very realistic. I really thought the Buccaneers were going to step up. I thought the defense was going to have a good game. And then I really just thought that Tom Brady was going to be able to get it to his receivers, at least make it a football game, at least for it not to be a blowout. I was wrong about that, but ultimately I'm okay with it because technically on paper, the Cowboys are the better team. So, I'm fine with that. The end result for me was cool. So the only two games that I really had a problem with was Chargers, Jaguars, and Dolphins, Bills. I, I did not like the way those games go, and I really don't like the NFL treating me like I'm a retard. Um, and then that one play in the Ravens-Bengals game, I was like, really? No. So anyway, that's my thoughts on that. Let's get to the divisional round. Really excited about this, guys, because you know I'm a Buffalo Bills fan. I really want to see my Bills take it. but. I, I'm going to tell you right now, I, I don't let emotion help me pick these games. And that's not the direction I'm going to go in, but I'll get into that game when it's up. 
our first game, we got the Jaguars plus eight and a half versus the Chiefs. I got the Jaguars to cover, Chiefs to win. I'm going to go over 53. And my question is, why can't the Jaguars cover the spread? Why can't they get it done? The Chiefs defense really hasn't shown its must this season. And I think the problem is, too, is that the extra players for the Chiefs up front, the pass rush, really isn't stepping up. Chris Jones is doing his job. Derek Noddy in the middle, those guys are clogging. They're doing what needs to be done. And Chris Jones is going to have to have an amazing game for them to stop the Jaguars' quick offense. I have to say that now because the fact of the matter is is that Frank Clark and Carlos Dunlap really aren't playing up to their level. I mean, those guys, uh, Clark and Dunlap, those are borderline superstars. Like they can, they have that potential. We haven't seen that from them. We just haven't seen it. And and Dunlap is forced into a bench rotation type role, which is really surprising to me, because I always felt like he was a physical type player that could really do everything. Really hasn't shown that. So I'm looking at that Chiefs defense, and I'm looking at how the Jaguars have been playing offensively. And I'm thinking, okay, even if Pat Mahomes comes out here and has a really good game, why can't the Jaguars somewhat go toe-to-toe with them scoring-wise? The receivers for the Jaguars are stepping up immensely. And, you know, I always go back and say, hey, look, I was wrong about this. Christian Kirk's time with the Arizona Cardinals really made him look like a bitch. But now when he's with the Jaguars, he's actually looking pretty good. He has refined his route running, and he has refined his catching ability. And he is a little bit less fearless. So he put in the work. He looks really good at what he does right now. So I give him credit. Zay Jones, the same thing. And when he was with the Buffalo Bills, he couldn't even locate the football when he turned around. Now he's running better routes. He's got speed. He's catching the football. So those two guys have gotten better. The Jaguars obviously saw some development in those guys. And uh, it ended up working out for them. So I give credit to that. I give credit to the Jaguars front office for believing in those guys because it paid off so I'm looking at that offense against that Chiefs defense that just to me isn't really scary Uh, again you know not a huge time pass rush outside of Chris Jones Uh, linebacking core you could take advantage over the middle of the field Ingram at tight end for the Jaguars might have a pretty good game and then the secondary for the Chiefs I think at most is overrated I mean when you get play action going you can get it down the field pretty easily and I think about ETN playing still at a high level, running the football. That's another dimension. That's another problem for the Chiefs and also an issue for the Chiefs because the Jaguars are going to have that ability to pound the rock, kill clock. The Chiefs don't have that luxury because they don't have Clyde Edwards-Alaire out there. They don't have a starting running running back that they can lean on. It's going to be all a problem for the Chiefs. The only chance the Chiefs have – I mean, the Jaguars could pull the upset, and I'm saying this. The only way the Chiefs win this game – is if Pat Mahomes has a monster game and he makes sure that no matter what the Jaguars do, that they're not going to catch them scoring-wise. That's how I see it going. That's why I'm going over. Next game, we got Giants plus 7.5 versus Eagles. I got the Eagles to win and cover, and I'm going to go over 48. Look, this isn't Giants hate, okay? I think they're going to be a really team, good team going forward. I like a lot of what the Giants have done. They're coached well. I just talked about how good they are in the prelude to this video, they have a lot of things going for them. But the Eagles have everything to stop all of that. So the Giants got a good pass rush. Okay, well, the Eagles got one of the best offensive lines in football. That's number one. Number two, yeah, Dory Jackson's back. That's wonderful. You know, Xavier McKinney, he's not bad, a little overrated, but not bad. But the Eagles got two. Well, their tight end group is pretty good too, but they got two top-notch flight receivers. Devonta Smith and A.J. Brown. So I'm not so sure Dory Jackson can even handle A.J. Brown. They're going to have to double him, I'm pretty sure. And then you're going to have Devonta Smith with his route running, with his speed. I think he's going to be a big problem in this game. And I think that's where the difference comes in this week. I mean, the Vikings, they got Jefferson, but Thielen really, and the tight end group for the Vikings really never stepped up when it counts. You know, Jefferson's really the one that goes out there and wins the games for the Vikings. Here with the Eagles, it's different because Devonta Smith, I know he's not as good as A.J. Brown, but he makes the plays like him. So for me, I think the Eagles just have those offensive tools that's going to help them run away with this game. And then on the defensive side, the Eagles are stacked. They have a great front seven, particularly on the defensive line, a lot of good rotational pieces. 
they're going to be coming at Daniel Jones like waves. And then you got the Giants with really no good receivers. I mean, they're really, they don't have much to work with there. And you got the Eagles with Darius Slay, Bradbury, a good pass rush up front. I just think it's going to be really hard for the Giants to move the football, even with good play calling from Dable. And then, of course, like I said, Eagles offense, I think is going to be too much on the other side for the Giants. Next game, the one that everybody's probably going to be talking about, probably going to be the highest betted game of the offseason or of the postseason, excuse me. Bengals plus five versus the Bills. I got the Bengals to win a cover. I'm going to go over 48 and a half. I love the Bills. If Josh Allen goes out there and has the monster game, plays unstoppable, runs at will, does all those things, plays reckless abandon, the Bills are going to have more than a puncher's chance. I get that. But let's just look at it from a basic standpoint. That Bengals defense is physical. They hit. Speed is a non-factor when you play the Cincinnati Bengals. It's a non-factor. They hit even the fastest. They'll hit Tyree Kill in the mouth and not think twice about it. These corners, these safeties for the Bengals, they don't get fooled by speed and double moves and worried about giving a fast receiver space, all of that. And the Bills offense mostly is completely built on speed at receiver led by Stephon Diggs. He's not size. He's not big and physical like Jamar Chase. He's all speed. Cole Beasley, all finesse. You know, no uh, no power to speak of at the Bills' wide receiving core. And the Bengals have shown their defense is equipped to handle that, uh, more so than I think I've seen any other defense in the NFL. So right there, the Bengals' defense has the nod up on the Bills' offense. Right there. Not to mention the Bengals got a good front seven and a good defensive line. You know, Hubbard, Hendrickson, those guys can keep Josh Allen in check, at least or at least stop him a little bit. So he doesn't go off the wall, crazy off the chain, you know, 100 yard rushing game, dominant victory. So that's one part of it. The other part of it is the Bengals receiving core. The Bills don't have anybody in the secondary that can go up against Jamar Chase. Tredavious White, yes, he's a number one corner. He's one of the better corners in the league. There's no doubt about that. But he doesn't have the size to go against Chase. And that's not to mention T. Higgins as well, who has really big size. Really big size. Um, Poyer, you know, he's not a tall, physical defensive back. White's not a tall, physical corner. Uh, the Bills have a lot of speed at the corner position. There's no doubt about that. So speed won't kill him for the most part. But big-time receivers like Chase that and Higgins that have speed and size, that can kill. That can kill. It's like having two A.J. Greens in his prime almost. You know, maybe T. Higgins isn't that great, but still, I mean, it's like that kind of a caliber receiver. The Bills don't have that and to stop it. And then on top of it, the Bills defensive line without Von Miller, they just simply don't get to quarterbacks. I mean, look at that game against Miami last week. I mean, you know, I mean, at times they got to Skylar Thompson, but for the most part, he felt comfortable. You know, a third string quarterback with three offensive linemen missing felt comfortable against his Bills pass rush. What does that tell you? Now, I know a couple of the offensive linemen for the Bengals are banged up. We know Jonah Williams has that fucked up kneecap and Kappa or, or another one of those, uh, the center, I believe. or I forget who the other guy is, but he's a little bit fucked up too. But I think they're both going to play. I think both those, and I know it's not Kappa because he's not on the team, but I'm thinking about another player. But I know that the Bengals have two guys hurt. They're both going to play, I believe. Um, even Jonah Williams with that dislocated kneecap. Uh, they said that they're going to go out there and uh, at least fight through it. And last season, it's important to note that Jonah Williams actually played through a dislocated kneecap. So he's already proven that he can do that. So I'm just thinking Joe Burrow, one of the best at what he does. I mean, you could I mean, put him right up there with Josh Allen when it comes to throwing the football. Not under pressure. With the advantage down the field with these receivers, I mean, the Bengals got this covered every which way to Tuesday. Easily. So I'm taking the Bengals because they have all the paths to victory. You guys do the math, see what happens in your head, but that's what I came up with. Let's cap it off with the final game. Perhaps the toughest one to choose, in my opinion. Cowboys plus three and a half versus 49ers. I'm going to go under 46, and I got the Cowboys to win and cover. 
Now, I do understand that the, the 49ers have some advantages here. They're at home, for one. I think coaching will play a little bit into this. I mean, I obviously, I like Shanahan more than I like McCarthy. The 49ers are a little bit better at receiver when you look at what the Cowboys have with them. So the firepower, okay, a little bit better for the 49ers. McCaffrey coming out of the backfield, all right. D-line linebacking core for the 49ers, okay, a little bit, a yeah, little bit collectively better than the Cowboys because the D-line for the Cowboys is a little bit, not exactly the deepest unit, and Micah Parsons is limping around. So that's a little bit of an issue. But then I thought to myself, all right, be non-judgmental. Think about where the Cowboys are at now. If this Cowboys defense comes out here and plays like they did against the Bucks and plays at that top-notch level like we know they can, if Micah Parsons rests all week, takes Novocaine shots, whatever, comes out there ready to go, and the Cowboys defense steps up, I think that they could get this done. I really, really think they could. McCaffrey on the short route, okay. Van Der Esch, Anthony Barr, these elusive safety players that Dallas has that got interchangeable parts that could play linebacker safety. I think they could neutralize McCaffrey to an extent. So that's one, that's one dog right there. I think Trevon Diggs. He can go against Debo, make that somewhat of a matchup. And then at least it's more of an even playing field because then it's like, all right, well, then Kittle's going to have to try to take over the game, and that's and that's pigeonholing the 49ers and what they can do. And I think that that's going to be a problem for a third-string quarterback in Brock Purdy. Maybe he'll have a bright future. I, I don't know. It's yet to be seen. This is his first year. The play calling has been great for the 49ers. Everything's kind of been working in their favor. But this isn't the Seattle Seahawks. Because the Seattle Seahawks don't even have anybody that can go against Debo Samuel, like I was saying earlier, let alone Kittle, you know, McCaffrey out of the backfield, all of that. The Cowboys do. You know, they have at least a way to change how you game plan. And they're going to have to make, you know, decisions in this game. Brock Purdy's not going to be always able to go to his first read. And I think that's the difference. The Cowboys defense steps up, surprises the 49ers. And then even though I'm not expecting Dak to be phenomenal against this 49ers defense, especially early on, I think as the game goes on and the 49ers offense struggles a little bit, Dak's going to keep getting his opportunities. And then that's when Pollard and Zeke, the run game behind that good offensive line, is going to show through. And then players down the field, will be able to take advantage of that 49ers weak secondary. I love Ward. I love the safety group, but they're not deep at secondary. You know, Ward might be watching C.D. Lamb, but guess what? Gallup, Schultz, the rest of these receivers, like Hilton on a deep shot down the field, these guys are going to get open as the game goes on. Um, that's why I'm going under 46, because I really feel like this is going to be a defensive game, especially for the first half. But then eventually something's got to give, and I think it's going to be the Cowboys offense that's going to have more to work with in terms of things being open. And then the Cowboys defense that ultimately steps up against the third string quarterback. So those are my picks for the divisional round guys. I hope this was a good breakdown for you. Um, this is how I see it. This is how I feel like it's going to go. Um, so good luck to you guys this weekend. Um, I'm actually going to be off. I'm getting out of work at two o'clock on Sunday, and then I'm going to race over to my family's house and we're going to watch the Bills game together. Um, and I'm really looking forward to that. I'm hoping my Bills win. I'm hoping, but as you guys see, I mean, the facts just don't add up to that. So uh, with that, make sure to hit the like button, share the videos and subscribe. I might do some news videos here or there about some of the coaching hirings during the season here, uh, maybe. Uh, but you guys know what's up. Most likely I'll be seeing you guys next week for the championship round.